carrying this loving awareness, carrying this wholesome mind, and simply inclining it to receive some words on the Dhamma. And welcome to Patrick and Hiran and Yurishini that just joined us. And tonight I thought I would uh, talk again about um, the eight spoked path of the awakened. So this Ario Atangiko Maggo, the Eightfold Path, because I realized it was almost uh, since last winter I uh, didn't talk about this very uh, fundamental aspect of the teaching. And so I will be reading the Vibhanga Sutta, which is a sutta in the Connected Discourses on the chapter of the, the path, Magga Samyutta. And this is a sutta where the Buddha is wonderfully breaking down the eight-spoked path in all of its division and just simply explains it uh, very clearly as he is able to do. And one of the things that um, this is uh, such essential knowledge for our meditation and for anyone who is interested in the, the Buddha's teaching, it touches at the very core of the Buddha's awakening. So it's very important. And uh, one of the key aspects of, of the uh, Eight Spoke Path is um, the first fold or the first spoke is Samma Ditti or wise understanding, what is usually translated as right view. And these are the four awakened understandings, the four noble truths as they are commonly known. I call them the four awakened understandings because the first discourse that the Buddha delivered after his awakening was explaining the Four Noble Truths. And a lot of the core of his awakening revolved around these Four Noble Truths, these Four Awakened Understandings. And so they are f very important uh, knowledge and to understand what they actually do and how they in fact work. And these four awakened understandings, they have the Eightfold Path within them. It is the fourth of these understandings. And the Eightfold Path begins with these four understandings. So each of them is within each other. And so they work together and beginning uh, this journey of the path, we also uh, want to remember what is this awakening of the Buddha, what does uh, Buddha means, and Bodhi, this awakening that we are speaking of. Bodhi means also understanding. And uh, what is it that we are practicing is this Dhamma, what is this Dhamma? And ultimately this Dhamma is to understand how the mind works, how the mind behaves. And ultimately understanding this, we will understand how everything else works. Because the Buddha said uh, in the opening gathas, the stanzas of the Dhammapada, uh, 
and if you came for the retreat, you probably heard it and remember. Is a mano pubban gamma dhamma mano sitta mano maya manasacha padutena bhasati wa karoti wa tato nang dukhang anweti chakang wa wahato padang. So mine is the mind precedes all things, all mental states, but also all things. And mind is their chief. They're all mind made. They're all mind created. Everything that we do is governed by the mind. And so with an impure mind, with an unwholesome mind, whatever is said or done it reaps into problems. <laughs> the angry mind the way that it behaves and the way that it flows into speech and action can only ca cause hurt for others and ourselves and these things come back to us. And so directly opposite to that the Buddha said Mano Pubban Gamma Dhamma Mano Sitta Mano Maya Manasa Cha Pasanena Basatiwa Karotiwa Tato nang sukhang anweti chaya waya na payini. Mind precedes all things. All things are created by the mind, governed by the mind. If with a pure mind or a wholesome mind a person speaks or acts, then happiness is bound to follow, like one's own shadow that doesn't leave. And so. These two gathas are very important for us to understand if we're interested in understanding the happiness that the Buddha was pointing to. And so to understand that everything is rooted in the mind and from there understanding if the mind is wholesome, then everything else is happy, is wholesome, is easy. And we're creating good conditions for ourselves in the future to be happy, to have less difficulties. But this is a path that needs to be walked by the wise because, like the Buddha said, uh, unwholesome actions are surely like milk. They do not curdle all at once. And so our bad actions, they don't, they don't turn sour all of a sudden all of them, they kind of, uh, they smolder under the ashes and so they lay there for a long time. And whenever the causes and conditions are right for that particular action that we've done in the past to come up, it comes up. And so we need to be wise to see this. We need some some amount of patience and some amount of awareness. And so understanding these things, we understand the beginning of the path, which is samaditi. But I will start here. Once in Savati, the Buddha said, Wise is this eight-spoked path, monks, that I will explain and break down to you. Listen carefully and apply your mind to what I will say. Yes, Bhante, replied the monks. Then the awakened one said this. What is this eight-spoked path of the awakened? It is here as follows. Wise understanding, wise attitude, wise speech, wise behavior, wise living, wise practice wise awareness and wise meditation. What is this wise understanding? And these are the four awakened understandings, the four noble truths. That is, knowing what is tension, knowing the cause of tension, knowing the release from tension, and knowing the way to release the tension. This is called wise understanding. Now, of course, you might have heard 
uh, this these four noble truths translated as suffering <laughs> and it is it can be applied uh, but usually it tends to scare people also uh, and it also can create some problems uh, with giving a bit of a distorted understanding of what the Buddha's teaching truly was yes it's true we can uh, encounter some really gross situations which are uh, yes we could use the word suffering for it but uh, I and throughout this explanation of the path I will try to use vocabulary that is more relevant to a direct meditation practice and so for our direct purpose here in the meditation knowing tension is very important for example and this is represented in the first four steps of the anapanasati where the buddha says first to know the whole body and to to la calm or relax or tranquilize bodily tension as it arises pasambhaya kaya sankaram and then to bring up joy that is uh, and then to to feel happiness to feel at ease continuously and this directly here in meditation this is what we're looking for this tension this uh, seeing and understanding when tension arises and that is also in every sphere of our life when we start to get impatient uh, when we really want something that is not right now and all these unwholesome states in fact they come with tension they come with friction in our heart in our mind in our bodies and to notice that is the first step of what the Buddha called wisdom or discernment but it is it does not stop there and then we have uh, this wonderful understanding of what causes that tension well here we can say distractions but also here the Buddha answered in in a way that he said that all these unwholesome states or all this tension that arises only arises from three roots and these roots are wanting something outwardly uh, that is not here and now uh, not wanting something dislike pushing it away impatience and uh, confusion which can be uh, a mixture of many things but um, not knowing confusion is basically not knowing the four awakened understandings not knowing the path and so this tension is uh, this cause of tension the Buddha said it's tanha and that is of course usually translated as uh, craving but here we can only see this as simply this force that makes us leave this space of contentment so I usually call it instead of craving more like discontent why are we leaving that space where we feel content we feel uh, we feel uh, happy here and now and so this is the source of all this tension <laughs> that arises is this discontent because if we were content well all the time then it would be easy no tension and then the release the, the one of the most important part of all of this is also the release the end of this tension because this is what the truly the Buddhist teaching is about is to release that tension is to let it go 
In fact, he said, um, uh, Virago nirodo chago patinisago mutti analeo. And so that means, he said, to calm it down, uh, that is viraga. Viraga is to, to just to let it calm down, nirodo, so that until it ceases completely. And to chago is to give it up. And patinisago is taking out its support. And mutti is freedom, freedom from it. And analeo is not latching on to it, completely letting it go. So that is the third noble truth. And that is very important to understand. Some people also uh, explain these four un awakened understandings as uh, tension or um, trouble, the cause of trouble and then happiness and the cause of happiness. And that brings us to the fourth, which is um, the path, the way to release that tension, how to develop more happiness, less tensed states, less unwholesome states, to give them up. And the thing that is, we need to know about this is that once we let go of these states that are full of tension, for example, at different degrees, then what takes its place is free of tension, free of trouble, free of problems. Therefore, automatically, by nature, by the Dhamma, we, there is a lot of happiness. That is happiness. And so, it is not directly mentioned here, but that is the direct correlation, the relationship between the, these unwholesome states and letting them go, then only happiness arises. That is why it is the path to happiness. And here we are in the first section, the first section of the training, which he called discernment, panya. There's panya, sila, and samadhi, or bhavana. And uh, this panya, this discernment, and then there's virtue and meditation or development, mind, mental development. And in this section of uh, panya, discernment, here next comes wise attitude or wise intention. And what is this wise attitude? This is the attitude of contentment, nikkama. The attitude of non-anger, the attitude of harmlessness. Abhyapada sankapo and avihimsa sankapo. And these, these are the roots of the wholesome. So now we, I touched a little bit more about the roots of the unwholesome in the Four Noble Truths because we learn to see them for what they are. We need to know them so that we can identify and then let them go and, and pour the water of our awareness to feed and nurture the three wholesome roots, which are nikkama, either letting go, learning to letting go, and that is chaga, that is that is dana, that's generosity, charity, giving, cultivating this giving mind, this relinquishing mind that is not holding. The opposite of discontent or holding or clinging is giving also. And as soon as we give, we cultivate the opposite of clinging. And so we relinquish, we learn to continually let go and that is a very, very, very wholesome root. Now the first step was to see what the unwholesome was and now and to, to understand how it works, how to let it go, how to cultivate the path. And now from that wise understanding sprouts 
wise intention, wise attitude. Because then when we understand these four awakened understandings and how unwholesome states are not for our own welfare, we develop wholesome intention, wholesome wise attitude towards everything. But see, this is still in the mental realm. And that's why it begins with that, because that needs to be clear and understood at the root level of the mind. And so whatever we do, if we do it out of contentment, nikkama, and kama is all these desires at the senses. And when we're not, where we let that go, when we are not affected by it, our happiness becomes uh, unshakable. And then non-anger, which is that loving kindness, that forgiveness, patience, compassion, joy, and uh, calm. These all these Brahma Viharas, they embody this aggregate of non-anger, Abhyapada. And so, we learn to in line. Uh, line up with these wonderful uh, streams and harmlessness now these the this is the retaliating mind this is the this is a little bit coarser it's the mind that uh, this is also called delusion but um, this is simply not uh, it is the opposite of not seeing the opposite of uh, uh, of delusion here, which would be harmlessness, but also calm. I like to change this one for uh, uh, the opposite of restlessness, which is a major hindrance in our minds usually, and it is very closely related to uh, harm. The harming mind is very restless at that point. It's already far in. And so, harmlessness and calm. And so, giving up this, this uh, strong, and this, this is associated with the me, with the I want this more than helping you kind of thing. That kind of mentality. And so, when, when we line up with this, this contentment, this charity, this giving, and this non non anger, this compassion, and um, calm, then we naturally flow into the speech, because then we will see there is the speech, and then there is the actions, and then there is the living, the livelihood. So we are getting coarser and coarser and coarser. And what is wise speech? Now going from the mind, we go into the speech. That is abstaining from false speech, abstaining from spiteful speech, abstaining from unkind speech, and abstaining from senseless talk. This is called wise speech. And this is... Uh, sometimes people wonder why... Why can't they just talk whatever they want uh, or uh, swear or use really coarse language and things like that? The thing is that speech is a mirror of the mind. And so whatever speech that we say, that is in the mind. And if we purify, if we clean our speech, we are also at the same time cleansing our minds. And it is a very good indicator of what mental states people are in if when, whenever there is coarse, rash, harsh speech, coarse language. It is simply a wonderful uh, re reflection of what that person's mind state is. Um, very coarse and it is abrasive it is rough uh, on, on other people it is rough for the mind but sometimes um, that's the nature also of 
uh, not having a very clear awareness is that these things they kind of become familiar and we think that uh, we think we don't think much of it but it is affecting others it is uh, a bit of a getting a bit of a scrape of sandpaper on the mind <laughs> And so then we go into wise behavior, that is abstaining from mistreating living beings, abstaining from taking what is not given, stealing, and abstaining from sexual misconduct. Here for the monks it is complete celibacy, brahmacharya. But for everybody else who, well, it is a good practice anyways, but... Uh, for anybody else who's not uh, planning on be, being a monk for their, their life, <laughs> it's simply having a good practice, which means no harm coming to anyone, and uh, um, simply done wisely as much as possible. And this is called wise behavior, and see we are getting into, now there was the mind, and then the speech, and now the actions. And so, here at this point, uh, when we, and you've noticed now that these are the Panchasilas, the, um, the five virtues, the five training in virtue that we, um, that we undertake, which are the very foundation of, of the meditation and of the path. Because if we do not uphold these, then there will be a lot of remorse in the mind. We will, whether we like it or not, this is Dhamma, this is how things work when we lie openly, when we swear, when we hurt living beings, when we uh, have poor uh, sexual conduct. These things, they come back and they creep into the mind and they hunt us for a long time and depending on the level of coarseness the the intensity level of these uh, they can stick for quite a long time and so here the Buddha out of great compassion says simply clear clearing out the path saying like here this is very clear these states these things are very basic fundamental for your mind to be at ease, to be peaceful. Follow these guidelines and you will be happy. <laughs> so it is a very wise recommendation. And then this wise living, that is a righteous meditator, Arya Sawaka. I translate this as righteous meditator, but it's, it means a, a noble disciple or Arya, a disi Aryan disciple, but... Uh, also, righteous meditator is quite a digestible here. Abandons wrong modes of living and shapes a life by right modes of living. This is called wise living. And now this is simply in a broad approach, a broad level, simply having a livelihood that is not based on hurting living beings. Uh, often like these really um, obvious examples are given in the texts like uh, making poisons and like bombs and uh, weapons and um, making uh, like slaughterhouses and things like that uh, any kind of work that is directly related to these things better not do <laughs> uh, because uh, Yes, this is uh, especially when when our life is uh, drawing from this like uh, suffering and pain for a lot of living beings. That's what we live on. It's uh, very difficult for the mind. And um, so now we're uh, moving. Uh, having understood with wisdom with the mind how unwholesome states work with the wise attitude having seen with body speech and mind 
how to direct the mind, how to direct the body, how to direct the speech so that it remains wholesome. Now we are ready to begin meditation or what is called um, the samadhi, this path of or, or bhavana, this path of mind cultivation, the cultivating the higher mind. And so this comes into three steps, the wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. And what is this wise practice? That is, the first is to guard, to protect, to generate the intention to not give rise to unfavorable and wholesome states of mind. One endeavors with determination, strives and supports this with one's mind. Now the second, one generates the intention to abandon unfavorable and wholesome states of mind. One endeavors with determination, strives and supports this with one's mind. One generates the intention to give rise to wholesome states of mind. One endeavors with determination, strives and supports with one's mind, supports this with one's mind. And the fourth fold is one generates the intention to sustain already present wholesome states for their increase, growth, maturation, development, and culmination. One endeavors with determination, strives and supports with one's mind. Supports this with one's mind. Now, this is a, a lot of words. <laughs> describing these four simple steps that basically mean um, that this is the action verb of the path and what this does is that first it can be simplified into two simple steps to let go of unwholesome states and to bring up and cultivate wholesome ones and what are these uh, unwholesome states we've seen them previously with the wise understanding and these are the states that bring that come with tension that come with disturbance in the mind um, mainly outwards distractions dislikes and uh, restlessness but also um, doubt mainly there is laziness and sloth and torpor but um, at this point, we simply notice these distractions. That is the first step. The second is to let them go. And this is the direct application of the Four Noble Truths, the direct application of the Four Awakened Understandings in direct practice. And this is not something that is very well understood here in the West as uh, this right effort. In fact, it is seldom talked about, and it is by far the most uh, important part of the path because it is the action, it is what we are doing. And that is where the relaxing comes in, that is where the Brahma Viharas comes in, come in, uh, the loving kindness, the, lo the compassion, the joy, the boundless calm cultivating these wholesome states they are in this is that fold where we we do this so the action of meditation is centered around this wise practice right effort and so this is very important for us to understand in fact it is about about abandoning unwholesome states and these are the the indications in dhyana panasati uh, using the breath as a reminder to know the body, for example, the whole body, simply as it is, and knowing these tension that arises, these kaya sankaras, and calming them down, pasam bhayam. And as we saw earlier, this third noble truth is viraga niroda chaga patinisaga mutti analaya and so to calm it down to until it stops and to give it up to remove its supporting cause 
and to be free from it, to not latch on to that, to let it go. And to bring up joy, which is the next, interestingly, the next step in the Anapanasati, which is very uh, overlooked and not very much talked about, and how important that step is to bring up the joy. It's not enough to just relax. It's also we need to bring up that joy. We need to be joyful. One of the one of the meditation instructions, very very simple, that the Buddha gave to one of his most advanced uh, Aryasavaka disciple, uh, Mahakasapa. He said three things, but one of them was to to constantly uh, to never let go of this awareness of the body with joy, and so that's quite interesting. And um, the importance of joy and the importance of the loving-kindness, for example, this boundless love that we are cultivating, it has piti in it, it has this joy in it, uh, naturally. And therefore, when we practice these Brahma-viharas, we don't need to talk about it so much because it, it comes with it. And that's why uh, it is so important. And that's why the smiling is so important because joy is a bit of an abstract concept that can be understood as many, many, many things. But when we say smiling, it is the natural expression of joy and that becomes much more clear, much more like a, an island you can grasp or hold on to or understand where that, how to bring up that joy. Just simply smile. No need to be a big smile, but... If you're smiling, you can be pretty sure you're closer to that joy. And at some point you will trick your mind. You will, your mind will become, will be joyful. Because there's been also studies done on this that even if you fake it, you, <laughs> the, the, the mind will be tricked after a while and it will become joyful. And so that, in that study, they even say, uh, "Fake it till you make it." So that's <laughs> that's also that's also what the 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 training is. It's in fact to continually, even even if it doesn't feel very uh, natural, then well, then we can wonder. Well, okay, then then what is the mind, the state of the mind at that point? If it doesn't want to smile then we can wonder oh well maybe uh, what is what's the state of my mind right now is it actually happy is it really aware or is it uh, judging or uh, criticizing and not wanting and so and we slowly learn this samadhi this natural samadhi that the Buddha taught through letting go of unwholesome states and bringing up joy and cultivating this, these wonderful states that are imbued with awareness, that come with awareness, like love, like compassion, like joy, like calm. That joy in the mind, and this is how the seven supports of awakening work and that is a major part of the Buddha's teaching. Joy is one of the supports of awakening and it's probably the most important. And it is through that joy also that feeds tranquility and tranquility feeds that joy also. And it feeds awareness, it feeds discernment. And so it is very important. And so that brings us to our next, to the next fold or the next spoke of the path, which is wise awareness. 
And he says, what is this wise awareness, monks? Here one meditates, resting one's awareness on the body, knowing it as only body, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tensions and distractions. Resting one's awareness on sensations, knowing them as only sensations, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tensions and distractions. See, this is seeing things for what they are, yata bhutang pajanati, and as they really are. And so we are not judging the sensations, we're not judging the body, we're not criticizing, we're not making a storyline about it. This is the pure awareness of the Buddha, the clear awareness by letting go of all these distractions and tension, the awareness becomes very clear. And these four resting places of awareness which constitute this wise awareness here in the Eighth Spoke Path, are simply the things that happen naturally when we let go of distractions, when we let go of tensions. Now, of course, if we bring, if we practice the Brahma Viharas, the boundless love, the boundless compassion, boundless joy, boundless calm, it is a little bit different because these states are about generating. These states are what the Buddha called uh, more like bhavana, producing that state which is powerful in itself but he also said that these states uh, they lead very close to nibbana but they don't lead all the way we need to let go of even these vehicles of awareness even as wholesome as they are we need to let go of them and uh, develop a completely object less samadhi um, which he called this animita samadhi uh, this signless samadhi or without an object that is completely open and that means uh, and that's what these four resting places of awareness the satipatthanas are they are completely pure because they are simply happening anyways whether we like it or not body is there there is awareness of body so when we let go of tension and distraction, the awareness naturally is aware of that, or it is naturally aware of sensations, or resting one's awareness on mind, knowing it as only mind, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tensions and distractions, resting one's awareness on mental states, whatever is happening in the mind. See, and this is the last one also because it is it tends to be fairly subtle we can do it here and now but it tends to be uh, a little bit later in the meditation when we have more awareness where the awareness is clearer because all these mental states are happening quite fast and sometimes we we can cling to them without seeing it so much but it is possible to just be aware. This is dhammas, actually. Uh, the, the Pali word for that is dhammas. And so this is also uh, all things. So all things that are happening, all, even the dhamma. And we learn to even see the dhamma as dhamma, only dhamma. Not having an opinion about it, not making a judgment, simply seeing it for what it is and resting the mind. Satipatthana upon these foundations letting go of tensions and distractions this is called wise awareness and so this wise awareness is a result from the practice from the wise practice that was the previous fold the previous spoke so now this wise awareness is not really something that we do and that is also fairly misunderstood uh, it's not we're not forcing awareness to be aware of something. In fact, that is wrong mindfulness. That is not what the Buddha taught. This is mitcha sati, mitcha uh, vayamo. This is wrong practice. To force the awareness on one thing is in fact controlling the mind. And the Buddha taught 
to liberate the mind. So it is very different practice. It is about letting go, opening up, relinquishing, calming down. And so by abandoning the tension, these distractions, these unwholesome states that are not states that are promoting awareness and bringing up these states that promote awareness, that are imbued with awareness and wholesome, wholesome awareness, there is, uh, this awareness comes up, this awareness grows, it becomes established, it becomes steady. And this is uh, how this wonderful awareness, this broad awareness, open awareness of the Buddha, uh, that the Buddha taught. And then by doing this, we do the practice, then we... Um, we do, the, it results in awareness. These, these four resting places of awareness are very wholesome states of mind that the Buddha said, especially because they don't, they have nothing in them. If we don't hold to anything, we're resting the mind on these, there is no clinging, there is no, there is no craving, there is no, so these are, he said, the uh, Visayas, the, our own fields, our own domains, our island. <laughs> and then by practicing this continually, we will get into these stages that the mind goes through. And these are called the jhanas. And here what I'm referring to are not the absorption jhanas. They are the aware open jhanas that naturally happen through wise practice by letting go of unwholesome states and bringing up wholesome ones and here these four states are described as such what is wise meditation disengaging oneself from the senses or sense desires or sense distractions sensory distractions Letting go of unwholesome states of mind, Th these are the five hindrances. Clinging outwardly, not wanting something, restlessness or agitation, sloth and torpor, and um, doubt. And that is doubt in the teaching. So when these become weaker, then the mind becomes stronger and clearer. In fact, it becomes free. That's why we call them hindrances. Intent attended by thinking and imagination. So at that point, the mind still has that faculty of thinking, of bringing up a wholesome object, for example, a spiritual friend, a person that you love, uh, a puppy or whatever, a scene uh, in nature or a place in nature that you love with the joy and happiness born of letting go and this is particular to this first level of meditation because uh, there is this there is great joy and happiness in letting go of the senses and letting go of the distractions for example when we read a book for a very long time for many hours and then all of a sudden you you just release your awareness from that task or maybe it is sewing for a long time really focusing hard onto one single task and then you you let go and you just relax and you smile see this is very close to this the to to this kind of happiness that the buddha is talking about Uriche wa, um We wake up, jung piti sukkang, the happiness born of letting go, the bliss born of letting go. And that is the first level of meditation. With the calming of thinking and imagining, with inner tranquilization, with inner calm, with the mind becoming unified. See, that means the first jhana is still a little unsteady. It's still a little. Uh, excited you know there is still quite a bit going on there's still that thinking even though it is completely wholesome at that point there might be some thinking 
but the second level is characterized by when this thinking and uh, imagining is falls away because it's too coarse for the mind at that point. And this is exactly what happens in this meditation as we move along. It's a road map. Unattended by thinking and imagination or thinking and reflection. With joy and happiness born of mental collectedness. This is samadhi. Now we've let go, let go, let go for long enough and we've become quite established in that first level of meditation which has that joy and happiness of letting go. And now we've let go so much the mind has become cleansed of the thinking and imagining. It doesn't really want to think anymore. It, it is just enjoying this blissful happiness of collectedness. And this collectedness happens as we let go of tension, as we develop that boundless love, metta, for example. That is one way. And if we use the anapanasati, then it's really by bringing up that joy and letting go of any tension in the body, any tension in the mind, gladdening the mind with joy, smiling. The mind becomes very collected. That's the natural samadhi, natural collectedness. One understands and dwells in the second level of meditation by the calming of excited joy for steady awareness. Now the excited joy becomes more tranquil, more steady, present and fully comprehending, experiencing happiness within one's body or simply ease, everything calms down. And see here we have the same sequence of the seven supports of awakening simply integrated in these levels of meditation. There was the joy and now the joy turns into bodily tranquility. That which the awakened ones describes as describe as steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. Now we discovered that this um, wonderful um, this wonderful awareness that is supported by joy by the letting go and joy they're like the two wings of this meditation and so we let go and we bring up the joy, whether it's through that loving kindness and with the smile. And the awareness becomes very steady and very joyful. And uh, then one person can know this is really a pleasant meditation. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation, leaving behind the notions of happiness and ha unhappiness with the earlier settling of mental gladness and affliction, with neither distress nor excitement, purified by unmoving presence, one understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. This is called wise meditation. And so here, there is a very strong uh, balance of mind and steadiness of mind, steadiness of awareness itself. And that is even better, the Buddha says in many, many suttas, it's even more blissful than all of these previous states, but it is more calm and so it is more subtle. And the mind though in that place really delights, really delights in that strong balance of mind and um, using this steady awareness now we've seen that the path begins with discernment or wisdom but it also ends with discernment or wisdom so we need that wisdom and discernment to begin the path but through the cultivation of this path we 
are cultivating awareness and discernment. So we are feeding, activating, uh, nourishing our capacity of discerning states because our awareness is increased through these levels, through this whole practice. By upholding the virtue, there's no remorse in the mind. The mind becomes very happy naturally by developing this uh, generous mind, this virtuous mind then abandoning unwholesome states, bringing up wholesome ones, going through the levels of meditation. And then the mind becomes, it sees very clearly states, it discerns, it is able to tell things apart. And this reinforces this whole path and it makes it very strong and established. And it's called the stream of the Dhamma. And that is all. <laughs> so that, uh, that is the, the Vibhanga Sutta. It is also found at the end of the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. It's very, very long Sutta. And this is just a very small part of that. But um, it is uh, a wonderful uh, Sutta that breaks it down completely and that makes it very clear what this path is because we all often talk about this eight spoke path and how it is you know like uh, oh this right view right intention right speech right uh, action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness and right concentration these are the usual terms that it's translated into but we uh, it's good to uh, to know what each of these folds are and so that it becomes clear to our in our minds so that the practice becomes clear so I hope this uh, this brought a little bit of clarity or strength or reinforcing the things that you already knew probably but uh, I hope that was helpful and if there are any questions uh, they are most welcome you can uh, you can ask good that means awakening is soon <laughs> i like that good now i would die how um, is also here we listen to the entire Dhamma today. It's very purple. Thank you, Bhante. Oh, good, good. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. I hope you are staying well and that you're uh, happy. And I, I'm sure you're happy. I hope you're healthy and uh, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Very good. All three of you. Okay, well, we can share our merits and then that will be it. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.